Hello, and thanks so much for attending the Citizen Science Bushfire Symposium. We have a really full program ahead, so I'll get started right away. But before I begin, I did want to acknowledge the lands on which we're all joining from today. I'm on Gadigal country, and I wanted to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. My name is Erin, and I'll be facilitating the symposium today. The reason for organizing this symposium is that following the Black Summer bushfires of 2019-2020, many people throughout Australia and across the world reached out wanting to know what they could do in response to this environmental disaster. We were caught a little bit on the back foot, and since then there have been some fabulous projects pivot or developed to try and address this, and we wanted to profile them here today. So citizen science is one mechanism that can place communities at the center of a process that generates new knowledge for disaster risk reduction and monitoring. And I think citizen science has a role in mitigating existing risk, monitoring pre and post event, and strengthening environmental, individual and community resilience and post disaster recovery. Involvement of citizen science can also, scientists can also have flow on effects like building community networks and developing skills. And I think participating in projects can help communities gain knowledge and capacity and better respond and prepare for disasters. It's been great to see that citizen science has been supported in the report on climate and disaster resilience. And this report gives due emphasis to the importance of citizen science and complementing, complementing traditional research led monitoring campaigns and sharing locally specific advice, which is hugely important. So this symposium will profile citizen science projects that were either initiated as a response to the 2019-20 bushfires or adapted in some way to understand the impacts. And our aim today is really to demonstrate impact through the augmentation of research, in addition to the benefits of engaging a broader cohort of people in science. We have a great lineup of speakers lined up with a mix of short and long talks, and we'll close the, the symposium with a panel discussion where we'd love to explore the significant untapped capacity for greater public involvement in recovery efforts and really examine how to better marry the professional scientific effort with the citizen science effort so that can, we can really harness the potential of citizen science. And we all welcome your questions posed in the chat, the chat function for the panel. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rachel Gallagher. Rachel is from Western Sydney University, and she'll be talking about the Flora Connections Project. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks very much, Erin. It's a pleasure to present in the symposium. So I'll be talking about Flora Connections, uh, which is a project to harness amateur flora groups for plant extinction risk assessment, particularly after the 2019-20 bushfire season. I'm speaking to you from Darkenjung land on the central coast of New South Wales. Uh, and this project is funded by the Australian government via their Bushfire Recovery for Wildlife and their Habitat Fund. So a brief history of the Australian flora. We have more than 26,000 plant taxa in Australia, species, subspecies and varieties. Uh, and we have major radiations in particular evolutionary groups. So things like the Proteaceae, the Myrtaceae and the Fabaceae, which are shown in this gorgeous image here. One thing to note about the Australian flora is that majority of the majority of our species are endemic. So 87% uh, of the flora occurs nowhere else in the world. Uh, so this makes it a remarkable place uh, to understand floral diversity. But it also makes it a challenge to assess plant extinction risk in Australia. So this map here details by country of the world, the proportion of the endemic species in their country that have an extinction risk assessment completed. And there are some places that have done particularly well, like South Africa, Sri Lanka, China and the United States. But Australia is down in the bracket of somewhere between 20 and 40%. In fact, 28% of uh, endemic Australian plants that have a threat assessment which has been completed. Gathering data on extinction risk takes field work. So getting out into the field uh, to collect data on population sizes, the number of individuals, the threats which are active across a species range, 
And of course, we can only assess these species as threatened where sufficient data exists. And I've popped up a picture here of the major vegetation groups of Australia to remind us that we have these vast landscapes over which we're trying to collect information to be able to list species under the EPBC Act as threatened. So of course, environmental crises increase the need for extinction risk assessments. And in particular, uh, for particular note for this symposium is the 2019-20 bushfire season where we conducted, me and a team uh, of colleagues conducted a national prioritisation of the Australian flora, looking at all 26,000 species and whittling them down to about 500 plant species, which required urgent field surveys to collect data about what's happening in the field after the fires. And that's what's indicated in this image here. We not only looked at where the fires occurred across the range, but also things like interactions with disease, post-fire feral animal herbivory, and severe pre-fire drought conditions. So the Flora Connection Citizen Science Project uh, is designed to harness the expertise of the network of amateur botanists and flora groups throughout Australia to collect data for us post-fire and beyond. Uh, there's, uh, as we know, a dearth of taxonomists in Australia. Um, there's been not uh, nearly enough investment in taxonomic research in Australia. And so many of the people with the skills that are required are now retired and working in amateur groups in across different parts of the country. So the goal for this project is to create high quality observations of plant species in the field, uh, which are crucial, crucial for listing assessments which are performed under the EPPC Act and state legislation. So the target data that we are going to be uh, having citizen science collect are things like the size of the mature population of species in the field, which threats are active and evidence of decline. The end users for this information will be the threatened species scientific committees of which I'm a member for the Commonwealth, uh, researchers who are interested in understanding patterns of, uh, of change uh, after the fires and the people who nominate species for listing under the EPBC and state acts. The anticipated outputs are a set of clear field guidelines for data collection, which meets the IUC and Red List criteria. And I've popped up a little image of uh, a potential version of that that we're developing. A dedicated web portal so people can enter and collate their data. Publications, of course, describing the methods and the outputs so this can be reproduced um, uh, by other groups. Improved data for extinction risk assessments. This is the primary goal of what we're after. And of course, stronger connections between botanists and government. So that's my five minutes up, but I've popped my email address in there and you're welcome to reach out to me to discuss the project or hear more about it. And um, I'll send it back to Erin. Thanks, Erin. Everyone in the session to please type your questions or your thoughts in the discussion forum or the Q&A box. So next up, we have Dr. John Martin and John is from Taronga Zoo and he'll be speaking about wildlife assist, optimizing the welfare outcomes for Australian wildlife after bushfires through provisioning. Over to you, John. Thanks, Erin. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. And it's great to be part of this group. Um, so yes, I'll jump right along. I'm, whoop, give me one second. Cool. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> All right, so I'm coming from Garingai country today in Sydney, uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, so Wildlife Assist uh, is actually a project that's about to get started. We wish we had 18 months of data or, or more, but um, it's something that's that's been building very slowly for a while. And, and this is something I, I know a number of people have had challenges with as well, uh, jumping in straight after the, um, uh, yep, All right, cool. All right, so look, here's just a photo from, uh, you know, right in the, in the action, fires are still burning. We've got dramatic habitat loss in these situations. Um, and so as Rachel mentioned, as a lot of us have seen, We've, uh, we know that there was over 18 million hectares burnt, uh, 
really significant loss of land in key habitats like the Blue Mountains and Gomwana Forests. And then not to mention all those animals that, that died. Uh, you know, a billion is, a, is an estimate. And we actually have a huge gap in our knowledge with respect to the number of animals that went into care or went into veterinary treatment. Um, so there's data out there, but it, it hasn't been clearly articulated at this point. However, this project, Wildlife Assist, isn't about the, uh, the treatment of, of wildlife through care. It's actually about the process that people undertook spontaneously to provide food, water and shelter, things like nest boxes, to animals in situ. Uh, all right. So as I said, we, we actually really want to assess the pros and the cons. So this is a new area. The, the stock standard position in Australia generally is let the wild be wildlife be wild you know no feeding and here we uh we had a situation where the community at large in, in a number of areas um, felt compelled to provide resources so food and water and in particular nest boxes to assist wildlife in response to the devastation and uh, i think we can all relate to that but the challenges that we have here uh, are multiple and so Firstly, the scale of these fires meant that we literally struggled to be able to provide resources uh, that were required. We didn't know what resources were required, you know, which species should we be targeting and, and where should we be putting these resources? And then there's also the risk. Are we introducing uh, threats to species? Are we actually um, putting them at risk through disease transmission or predation? or other mechanisms. Okay, so here's a, a photo of the Blue Mountains and we're about eight months after the fire. And so whilst there's no canopy, uh, there is a lot of vegetative growth and therefore other life processes going on. So there's insects and, and other things to eat. Um, still, you know, a pretty barren landscape. Didn't see a lot of animals, a couple of wallabies, a couple of birds. Uh, here's another uh, site. This is a field site we've been doing some research down uh, near Shoalhaven. And on the left, we have an unburnt site. And on the right, we have a burnt site about 18 months later. And we can see um, here that you know, there is really rapid revegetation. And 18 months is, is a long time period. But just saying, you know, the idea of supplementary resources um, we really don't understand how long they should be out there. Should they be a month? Should they be a week? Should they be a year? So there's just infinite questions. The other point with this slide is that these two patches are actually only a couple of kilometres apart. And so whilst there were huge continuous areas that were lost, there were also a lot of fringe areas where there was adjoining habitat that remained relatively intact. And, and so we don't have a good understanding about how species changed in those landscapes, uh, say shifting from the burnt to the unburnt habitats and whether or not the resources available in those unburnt habitats could actually sustain those populations. Uh, so ultimately, there's just a, a heap of questions. <laughs> um, all right. So in, in, an immediate action that happened back in 2020, January 2020, was that there was a wildlife task force developed. Uh, and this was because people were already out there feeding and they uh, ultimately the governments and different organizations wanted to provide some some advice and so develop guidelines and, and literally to be able to say hey if you want to target this species here's a potential food source that is commercially available and so zoos across australia were involved in this because there's a lot of experience there with feeding native wildlife in captivity uh, and those food sources like kangaroo pellets and bird seed uh, were commercially available and could be distributed um, to targeted areas as required. Uh, of course, there was always the caveat, should this be, um, should there be feeding, should there be provisioning going on? So it was all a bit of a, a mystery. Um, all right. So we might be aware that the state government in Victoria and New South Wales both undertook dramatic actions to drop food from helicopters into threatened species populations. This is completely unprecedented. And in New South Wales in particular, it was in response to community pressure. Victoria had already done this and there was quite a bit of media saying, hey, why, aren't, why isn't New South Wales doing this? 
And there are a number of reasons. We Did those animals need that food? Was this actually going to be beneficial? Was it going to alter their behavior, perhaps make them more vulnerable to predation? You know, how is this going to alter uh, ecosystem functions? And then in the bigger picture with respect to wildlife provisioning, there was also the human dynamics. So people potentially putting themselves at danger, people also having quite a lot of stress from uh, the, the scenes that they are experiencing. Um, so here's just an example from the Port Macquarie area, uh, the local wildlife group up there, Fauna. So they spent about $40,000 and put out 15 tonnes of pellets, mostly kangaroo pellets, and 13 tonnes of bird seed. Uh, these are large quantities of food, and there isn't a lot of data to say that that was beneficial uh, or, or maybe it was negative. We don't know, but we know it happened. <laughs> and this was, this was repeated multiple times across the country. Uh, there were other groups that put out much larger quantities and, and spent much larger amount sums of money. Um, and so hence developing some guidelines and they're available online still to provide advice about what, what food sources you could provide to animals, how you could provide it. Um, all right. And so then from that, we developed this wildlife assist project where we're like, all right, it'd be great to be able to collect data into the future in association with these events and learn about the food, the water, the shelter that is being provisioned and the species that are actually utilizing those resources. And so um, myself and my colleague, Michelle Shura Taronga, sort of initially um, with other colleagues at the zoo, started this project and now it's expanded to include colleagues at Sydney Uni, UNE and RSPCA Australia. Um, so this, this app does exist. We haven't promoted it as yet. So you can go and download Wildlife Assist. We're just still tweaking a couple of little things as can happen with apps. And then no doubt there'll be more tweaking. Um, but it does provide, it does serve multiple functions. So it actually provides a resource to learn about the resource, uh, the food, the water and the shelter you can actually provide for different species. Um, and then secondly, it can actually, it's for people to record that information as we'll go through. All right, so for some species, for example, koalas, there can be no recommendation sometimes, you know, it's not recommended to feed a species. Koalas are hugely difficult. They have very specific um, leaves and they want fresh leaves every day. So it's a really challenging species to be provisioning for in the wild. Um, but Anyway, another, uh, so if you've got species that are struggling, one of the things the app does is it actually has a database of all the wildlife care groups across the country and their contact details. So you can actually reach out to those animal, uh, those groups and uh, seek help for those animals. Um, all right, so how we see this working is that different groups can uh, will form and that might be an existing group like Fauna, their members can work together and through the app, be messaging each other and communicating about the actions that they're undertaking. In addition to recording data, so mapping where they're putting food or water or shelter out, uh, how much food, what type of food, what animals they're seeing utilizing those resources. So we're trying to essentially start the process of understanding the on-ground actions and the potential ecological consequences of that, whether they be beneficial or negative. Um, as I said, yep, so recording quantities uh, and collecting information about that. Uh, again, for water, uh, we know water is quite easy to put out in the landscape, but is it actually being utilised by the different species that are, that are targeted for that? And then lastly, shelter. Shelter is a really interesting one because there's a lot of talk about the benefits of nest boxes, but there's not always a lot of evidence about the immediate use of nest boxes by wildlife uh, following fire. So there's, there's just a huge amount of knowledge gaps here. All right, we can upload photos as with most apps. And so we can try and collect a bit of a database of the species that are, are present in the landscape and those that are actively using those provisioned resources or natural resources in that area. All right, um, so none of this can happen without people, of course. We're here all here talking about citizen science. And one of the things that's, um, that's really valuable for this project is there are a huge number of uh, established 
wildlife care groups and community groups that were active in this space. So there's actually thousands of people who have already been doing a bit of, of work in response to the, the mega fires last year. Uh, what we've seen subsequently is that groups in other areas have followed those actions, even though they, they were unprecedented. And with fires about a year ago in Adelaide, immediately the different community groups were out there provisioning. So this is a bit of a change in the landscape and the psyche in Australia because this was well and truly a um, uh, something that had not happened before. People did not go out and dump bird seed in response to bird for, uh, in response to bushfires previously. At least it hasn't been well documented. So there are a large number of stakeholders that are already engaged and will be engaged in more detail. But the point that I want to highlight here is also that we're really interested in that human dimensions, the, the change in our behaviour that we, we want to go out and help these animals. And we know it was a pretty dramatic fire, but uh, the mega fires, but still it's one of the things that I struggle with is it, it does feel like it's a bit of a drop in the ocean when it comes to putting out a ton of bird seed across a million hectares. So it's, um, it's an interesting situation to try and, and achieve the best outcomes for targeted species that you can help. Um, and the human aspects of that are actually going to be really important. Uh, so one of the things we want to do is actually do some manipulative experiments associated with this to try and have a bit of uh, control of the situation. So we'll, we'll be planning those ahead um, in, the, in the seasons ahead. And so to that end, uh, we have a number of stakeholders involved. Uh, we're shortly going to be advertising for a one-year postdoc at Sydney Uni. So if anyone's interested in the social science postdoc, so that's actually looking at the human dimensions, um, get in touch. We're also keen to recruit a PhD student um, that actually have to apply for a scholarship at Sydney Uni. Uh, that, that would need to go in in about a month's time. So if, again, if someone's out there or you know of someone who'd be really interested in this space, get them to get in touch with us. Um, and so, yes, we want to experimentally assess the wildlife response, and we also want to engage with the, the land managers, the policy makers, the citizen scientists. You know, this is a whole new space that um, really actually needs some regulation. And uh, uh, regulation isn't the word I wanted to use. Uh, is actually some, some policy that actually advises how we want to proceed in the future. And I'll give you a quick example. One was many of the national parks in New South Wales said no to letting people come in and provision. So people were illegally provisioning in those lands. Uh, and equally in Western Australia, it is illegal to provision. So anyone who was putting out food or water in response to a fire was breaking the law. Were those people prosecuted? No, but it's an interesting space when you're talking at the policy level about what is allowed and what should or could be allowed. Um, all right. So thanks everyone for listening. There's my contact details and hopefully uh, we can chat some more and, and collaborate with all the participants here about this in, uh, interesting new area of research. And thanks Erin for organizing this, this session. Thank you so much, John. We've got some great questions rolling in, so we'll get to those shortly. Just wanted to introduce the next speaker. Thomas Mezaglio from the University of New South Wales. And Thomas will be speaking about the Environment Recovery Project, Levering Eye Naturalist to Understand Recovery from Australian Bushfires. Over to you, Thomas. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Erin. And I'd just like to acknowledge that I am speaking today from Gadigal Country in Sydney. So set up by record hot temperatures and low rainfall, Australia's black summer bushfire season across 2019 and 2020 was one of the worst ever. New South Wales was especially affected with millions of hectares burnt. With catastrophic events like these predicted to become more frequent and severe, understanding how our native ecosystems recover from them is an important But when these events cover such enormous areas, it becomes difficult for scientists to monitor and collect data from everywhere. This is where citizen science initiatives like iNaturalist come to the fore. iNaturalist is an online biodiversity citizen science platform. Users take photos of organisms they encounter and then upload them to iNaturalist via the phone app or their computer. Other users will identify your sightings and then the data get exported to the ALA or GBIF. In late January 2020, 
we set up a project on iNaturalist to collect observations from burnt areas to help us understand which species were returning to the firegrounds and when. Can also prompted to fill in extra data fields, two relating to the severity and reach of the fire, and one of three relating to the organism they observed. Our project has had huge contributions across almost the entire New South Wales coast, as well as areas including southeast Queensland, eastern Victoria, Kangaroo Island, and Stirling Range National Park. In under two years, we've received over 16,000 observations, covering more than 2,600 species and contributed by more than 400 users. These have covered everything from the Mount Kapitar pink slug alive and well, to grass trees re-sprouting among the ashes, to wedge-tailed eagles returning to feed on carcasses, and of course, everyone's favorite celebrity plant, the pink flannel flowers. And we've already published research using some of these data with several key findings. The first is that users contributed observations across a huge taxonomic range. There were, of course, some biases towards some of the more charismatic or commonly encountered species. But whilst many papers and published estimates focused on impacts on vertebrates or plants, our project was also able to collect observations across many invertebrate groups that are typically poorly understood with respect to their fire responses. Second is that focusing in on southeastern Australia, observations were contributed across most of the extent of the fire grounds representing burnt areas and the points representing individual observations. Importantly, this figure was made way back in March 2020. Fast forward more than 16 months and there are now relatively few remaining areas that burnt that have not been visited by at least one observer. Third, many observations were made in areas where fires had been raging just a few days earlier. This has been one of the greatest strengths of our project the ability to monitor recovery in the immediate aftermath of fires, and to also continue this monitoring over extended periods at the same location. As an amazing example, one user posted these photos of dinner plate sized fungi that appeared en masse just three days after a fire tore through Kingaroy in Queensland. During an earlier slide, we asked users to fill out a data field relating to fire severity. Our categorical citizen science measure of burn severity correlated well with the continuous measure of remotely sensed temperature of the fires. Whilst these data are of course not designed to replace the remote sensing data, one advantage is that ground observers can more clearly see the effects of surface fires where the canopy is unaffected. We also took away some valuable lessons. One is that publicizing the project is really important we had significant spikes in engagement following stories released on mainstream media. Another is that our use of iNaturalist and its pre-existing data structures allowed for rapid and efficient data collection without any costly or time-consuming overheads like development or programming. So what now? Users continue to submit new observations every day, and we're also now accepting observations from upcoming bushfire seasons so the project will be a valuable data repository for tracking recovery in the coming years. We've launched a website, which includes a fantastic podcast series. And we have multiple papers in the works that use the data from our project in some really cool ways. I thought I'd end with two quotes that highlight not only has our project been a great success from a scientific perspective, but it's also allowed us to engage with the community and connect them to nature in a meaningful way. I'd like to finish by thanking the amazing people involved in this project, the many groups and organizations who have provided us with funding and support, and of course, the many citizen scientists who have contributed observations to the project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's such an inspirational project, and um, I hope to talk a little bit more about it on the panel discussion. So next up, we have Lauren Hookwalker, and Lauren is from the Department of Planning, Industry, and Environment. And Laura will, Lauren will be speaking about that Glossy Black project. Over to you, Lauren. 
Thanks, Aaron. G'day, everyone. I'm Lauren Hook. I'm a Threatened Species Officer working on the Glossies in the Mist project, and I'll be talking to you today about citizen science and glossy black cockatoo conservation. I'm also speaking to you from Darawal land, and this work is undertaken on Gundungurra country. Okay, so just glossies in a nutshell. They're vulnerable in New South Wales and endangered federally. They're widespread in Eastern Australia. They are specialists with modified robust beaks for ripping open shiok cones so they can eat the protein rich seeds from inside. They pair bond for life and they raise one chick a year that need large deep hollows to nest in. And these habitat requirements add to their vulnerability as a species. And unlike most other birds, the female glossies are the most colorful of the pair with patches of yellow plumage on her head. Um, and these patches we use to, in, um, to identify her to an individual from photographs. Um, and like you can, you can see that in this photo of Quiggy down the bottom of this slide. So um, citizen scientists send in photos and we can identify them to individual. All right, so the Glossies of the Mist project is located in the Great Western Wildlife Corridor, which spans the Southern Highlands and links large wilderness areas together. This wildlife corridor falls predominantly on rugged private land and it makes traditional methods of estimating glossy black cockatoo populations, such as dam counts or um, bird surveys quite unsuitable due to the access issues. And to combat this, the Glossies in the Mist um, program teamed up with community champions way back in 2018 to co-create a photo identification project focusing on cataloging individual female glossies, we like to call them flossies, um, using their plumage patterns from photos submitted by the community. Um, this is just one section of the Glossies in the Mist project. Um, there are many others such as habitat protection and enhancement. We've also got a nest box trial that we're monitoring quite um, intensively as well and private land conservation. So the 2019-20 um, bushfires affected both the wilderness areas to the south and the north of the corridor and the corridor has been critical refugia for many species including glossy black cockatoos. So at the time I didn't realise how effective and fun this project would be. Um, a core group of bird watchers and landholders got behind the process and it really took off. Now, not only can the Southern Highlands community identify a glossy, they now follow known individual flossies. Um, the community photos are compiled into individual flossy profiles, as you can see this one in the slide here of Mabel, and catalogued into area lookbooks. So you can flick through when you get a new flossy and see if she's in there. As you can see in Mabel's profile, she's been sighted two years in a row and both times with a juvenile. And this is um, these sightings have given us a really big insight into the breeding success of our local population. So the methods are really simple, um, as glossies frequently feed in low branches and they, you don't even really need a camera, like a fancy camera to, um, to photograph them. You can just use your phone. Um, we've trained the community members to take photos of the flossies face on both sides, and then they submit the sightings to the glossies in the mist survey form with any behavioural or group details. The photographer can then check the area lookbook to see if they can match the flossies themselves. And, um, and then we send the photos to the amazing Glossy Gang who are the, um, the core group of volunteers that will determine if they're a match. And if, the new, if it is a new bird, the photographer will be able to give her a name and um, we'll put her up on the Facebook page and, and share that with the community. So the results of the project, um, it's been truly community led and such a success. And so, so far we've got 194 profiles of flossies in the corridor and 70 profiles that have been recited multiple times over the life of the project. 18 females have been recited over multiple years, which has been quite tricky, but we've got there in the end. Um, 22 of the females have been cited with a juvenile and some with repeat juveniles each year. And as the project grows, we are recording more repeat sightings of flossies, which is helping us identify movement patterns, protect and enhance significant habitat and monitor breeding success. Um, all of which would be a lot harder to understand without this wealth of, of citizen science data. Um, the Glossy Gang is actually built of five core identifiers and we have 35 regular contributing photographers and over 450 community, community members involved. And landholders are now on a first name basis with the flossies and the families that are foraging on their block, which is pretty cool. Um, after the 1920 wildfires, there were um, a lot of community outreach about our local glossies. And there was also lots of um, sightings of large flocks, which are quite rare in our area. Um, the Glossies of the Best project was able to draw on an already trained group of volunteers um, who've been trained in sensitive observation techniques to go and photograph the birds in these flocks. 
And um, from this reactive monitoring, we discovered some interesting post-fire insights. So some of the flossies that were already feeding in the area before the fires, like the flossie in this photo, um, her name is Sunset, and um, she's been photographed in and around the Buxton area since 2014. Um, and so she was feeding in Buxton two days before the um, the bush, summer bushfires came through, and it was a really severe bushfire in that area. And then she was also photographed again a week later with her mate foraging in a in a burnt area that still had some she oak in it. Um, so that those records enabled us to see that she survived the severe bushfires. Um, another point was that the birds photographed in the flocks directly after the bushfires were not birds that we knew previously from that area and supporting the idea that they've been pushed out of the surrounding areas that had burnt um, during the wildfires. Um, directly after the wildfires was the highest density of new flossy sightings recorded. And um, we've been able to see some of these flocks disperse over time. And some of the new, some of the new flossies have stayed in their new area for up to eight months foraging. Um, and so, yeah, the dedication and support of the citizen scientists has greatly increased the reach and momentum of this project and has allowed us to answer some of these interesting post-fire questions and also ensuring the longevity and um, conservation goals for glossy black cockatoos in this area. So thank you so much for your interest and um, feel free to ask me any questions in the chat and I'll hand back over to Erin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. I have such a soft spot for glossies. Uh, and I think we're already seeing a few themes in this symposium, and, that, and one of them is obviously the importance of baseline monitoring. So our last speaker today is Dr. Talia Perry, and Talia is from the University of Adelaide. And she'll be talking to us today about bushfires on Kangaroo Island and how they affect the gut microbiomes of echidnas. Over to you, Talia. Thank you, Erin. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, so I would like to acknowledge the Ghana people whose land that I am on today. Uh, and I'm going to dive straight into it with a dramatic photo um, of an echidna that was submitted to us uh, of, as you can see, it kind of looks like it's had a, a buds cut. Uh, but this is actually an echidna that's been caught in a fire. And a way to explain how echidnas respond to fires, which is quite unique, um, is from a lovely animation uh, by Anatomica Science. And so what happens is echidnas have a way of sensing fires when they're, when they're coming. And so what they do is they'll usually dig underground if they sense it in time. And then they go into what is known as a torpor-like state, which is essentially a very deep sleep. And they can slow down their body metabolism. And so they don't need to come up for food um, and can basically breathe through the soil quite remarkably. But unfortunately, sometimes the echidnas themselves don't dig as far under the ground as they should do. And so then they get uh, the fire running across them and that's when they get burnt. And that's when you get that dramatic uh, buzz cut looking um, echidna that, that we had um, submitted to us. So echidnas have learned to adapt to fires because they've been around in Australia for so long. So echidnas fall in the group of monotremes uh, we, along with the platypus and we have the short-beaked echidna here in Australia but there's also the long-beaked echidna in Papua New Guinea and they're most well known for being the only egg-laying mammals um, but what you might not know is that they are the oldest surviving group of man mammals so they split from marsupials and eutherians about 187 million years ago and so echidnas have been around in the Australian environment for a very long time, and it means that they've been able to adapt to the fire landscape in Australia. The issue is, though, that with the mega fires that happened in 2019 and 2020, they were such an intense fire over such a large uh, geographic area, and they lasted for a lot longer than a typical fire. Um, the question was, how did echidnas actually fare during those fires? And we didn't know any other groups that were looking into that. There was a lot of um, publicity for things like the koalas and the kangaroos where you could physically see them um, burning, uh, which is obviously dramatic and awful, but uh, we still were really concerned about what was happening with the echidnas for these particular fires and seeing if we can get a grasp on um, what was happening with them. So as you can see here, this is a map of Australia and in the yellow is the burnt areas from those 2019, 2020 fires, and in red, other sightings of echidnas over the last three or four years. Uh, so echidnas are definitely overlapping with those fire areas. Uh, so we were able to do this project because we 
uh, because I run a citizen science project called Echidna CSI. So this is a national project um, where essentially people download the app that we've made and record sightings of echidnas out in the wild and do also collect echidna poo for me, which is the most important part of this research, um, looking at the microbiomes. So uh, I'm actually giving a talk on the whole Echidna CSI project tomorrow, so I won't go into detail about that right now. Um, but this is the reason that we're able to do this research, because we already had data from prior to the fires and allowed us to then collect more data and material after the fires, which is a really unique data set. Um, luckily, we are at the moment, uh, we have over 12,000 participants across Australia. Um, which have given us 12,000 echidna sightings. And to put that in context, that's more sightings over the four years than has been over the past 10 to 20 years. Um, and obviously the power of citizen science. And people love collecting poo for me. So that has been very helpful for this project. So going back to this map here, um, we were interested in looking at um, the the effect of the fires and to do that as a pilot study we were lucky enough to get grant funding from the foundation for national parks and wildlife and we focused this study on kangaroo island here in south australia and that's for several reasons um, kangaroo island uh, is physically close to us here in adelaide so it was something that we had um, tangible uh, abilities to actually use as a as a model system uh, also the kangaroo island population of echidnas is the best studied echidna population in the entire of Australia. Um, and that's thanks to a collaborator of ours who's very heavily involved in echidna CSI, Dr. Peggy Reese Miller, who's been studying echidnas on Kangaroo Island for over 30 years. Unfortunately, from her, this is uh, that echidnas are listed now as endangered on Kangaroo Island. Um, so these fires are also um, really it's important to understand how the fires affected that particular population because they're already listed as endangered. What we saw um, from the sighting data, um, this is the, the sighting data that we had in Kangaroo Island previously before the fires. So this is between 2017 to 2020. Uh, and again, another thing that was really great with this project was that we already had such an active citizen science community on Kangaroo Island who have already been provided, providing us with data, a significant amount of data and material for that area, which was really important for a pro project like this. Um, and then after the fires, uh, so this here is the burnt area of Kangaroo Island. So it was 50% of the island that was burnt during those fires. And so that's 50% of echidna's habitat um, and food sources destroyed. We saw echidnas emerging immediately after the fires. So uh, you can even see down in Flinders Ranges here, we've got a few things um, in the month or two after the fires, which is great. And then we also saw um, for the following uh, year to 18 months, um, we're getting a dramatic increase in sightings again. So it does seem that echidnas are going back into those environments or were able to survive in those environments initially, which is a great first time. But we were mostly interested in finding out more information about how fires actually affect echidnas. And we have been using our genetic toolkit to be able to do that. So this is also an image uh, very immediately after the fire. So you can see the very stark contrast of the burnt areas. Um, and this is Peggy here, uh, who uh, was the first one to see, um, one of the first ones to see the echidnas post fires. So again, the, the amazing um, part of this project was not only did we have a community, but a community base already on there, we had the world leading expert in echidnas who was able to also get um, data and material for us post fire as well. At Kangaroo Island, again, we've got the burnt areas here. Um, these are the locations that we had uh, scat samples from. So this is a kidna poo here, um, collected before the fires. Uh, we had from other locations, but these were the ones that we used in this pilot study. We had three samples from each location. Um, and then these are the, the um, areas where we were able to collect scats after the fires, a combination of Peggy's work and a couple of citizen scientists finding echidna poo for us as well. Uh, so the reason that we were asking for poo in particular is because um, I was really interested in looking at the gut microbiome and seeing if there were any changes associated with the fires, which I believe has never been looked at in any animal before, let alone echidnas. 
The reason that um, the microbiome is so important and also such a good indicator is because um, even us humans and every other animal out there, uh, the genetic makeup of us, 99% uh, of that comes from the bacteria living on our on and inside of our bodies. So on our skin, inside of our guts, inside of our mouths, inside of our digestive tracts um, is, is mostly some sort of microorganism. And then they make up 99% of, of the genetic makeup um, rather than the 1% that is just actually us or actually that. By looking at the uh, types of communities uh, in the certain areas, we can get an understanding about more information of that animal. So for example, if we're looking at the gut microbiome, uh, it also gives a really good indication of how food is being broken down and also related back to what the animal is actually eating and their diet. Uh, the types of bacteria will also work to fend off pathogens and also even work to stimulate your immune system. So they play a really powerful role and are a really good indicator to then give us extra information about an animal or about ourselves that we wouldn't be able to know by just simply seeing an animal. Uh, and this is also particularly important with echidnas because they're really hard to study and find in the wild. It takes approximately, I think, 40 hours or more of field work to find one echidna. So this is definitely a much more uh, uh, time efficient way of actually finding out um, than we could do it out in the field. So this uh, microbiome field has been really rapidly growing over the past 10 to 20 years. So the Human Microbiome Project was a large nature paper uh, published in 2007. Uh, and so it's been very human focused for the first decade or so, but now we're starting to understand how the microbiome is actually really implicated for, for animals and especially for conservation biology too. We need to know the health of the animals out in the wild or how they're transitioning into captivi captivity to see um, what the health implications are for them long-term. So the way that I do my research is by collecting the echidna scats or other people collecting the echidna scats, scats for me. Uh, we're able to extract the DNA from these samples and then we target a particular gene. So it's a 16S gene in bacteria. And then you essentially do a DNA sequencing on a large machine. You get a bunch of data out and then we analyze this in a program called CHIME2. And that allows us to then have a look at the specific species of bacteria that are in those scats and also look at the community structures of those um, scats as well. So going back to our um, project for, for the bushfire analysis, we're looking at what the microbiome looked like in the before the fires in the scat samples, and then what they look like in uh, after the fires. And to be honest, when we started this project, I had absolutely no idea if we would even see some sort of change or any sort of indication, but we were quite surprised at how dramatic the change was. So this plot here is just showing all of the individual samples. So in the green, we have the samples that were before the fires. The um, orange and yellow samples are after the fires. And then the orange samples here are these two that were directly in the fire zones, whereas the yellow ones are the ones that are outside of the fire zones. So what we're seeing here is that um, the samples that were after the fires are all clustering together. And so they are looking more similar to each other and looking very different to the ones that um, were before the fires. So we're seeing a complete shift in the microbiome um, before and after the fires. And what's most interesting about this is that it's not just the ones that are directly in the that have changed. It's these ones that are even peripherally near the fires. So what we think is happening is that echidnas, they usually uh, will, will uh, travel quite significant distances in and outside of the fires, um, uh, in, uh, sorry, just to find food. And so what we think is happening is that these echidnas here are actually foraging probably within these fire affected areas, or there might be um, other parts of the fire such as ash that further across to these areas in order to change their gut microbiomes. And the reason that we think that is because this sample here is actually the one that's clustering with the before the fires. And so this is quite a significant distance to the fire areas. So it's unlikely this echidna here had the chance to go back and forth. And so that's why, they're, why their gut microbiome looks more similar to, um, to this area here. If we're looking at a little bit uh, more detail into what's happening, um, we can actually look at the communities of the gut bacteria. So this here um, 
is each individual sample is a unique bar. And then we have them clustered here as the after the fire samples and the before the fire samples. And essentially, um, these the length of the bars indicates how much of that type of bacteria was in each of those samples. So right at the moment, we're looking at a phyla level. So this is um, a larger classification system. And then we can drill down to a genus or species level. So the phyla level is telling us that essentially we're seeing these two types of bacteria here, the proteobacteria and the actinobacteriota, are dominating in the before the fires. And then after the fires, there's been a complete switch to Firmicutes and Bacteriodota. That might mean a lot to you right now, but if we look more at drill down at the genus level, we can actually look at what the functions are, of the likely functions of these bacteria are. So this might be a little bit overwhelming, it's okay. Um, but what we're seeing here is that um, we can have a look at the different types of bacteria that are in all of these samples and make conclusions based off of that. So for example, this bacteria here, Acinobacter, that's quite commonly in the before the fire samples and that's a soil bacteria. So we're seeing obviously the echidnas before the fires were sucking up soil with this and that's what we see in the scats. And then uh, the ones after the fires, that bacteria must have been uh, been taken out of the soil because the topsoil would have been burnt during the fires. So we're seeing um, that we can, the soil is making up a significant part of their gut microbiome. We're also seeing that there are particular species like Pedagococcus um, and uh, these other uh, co cocae uh, type um, uh, bacteria are also very common plant fermenting bacteria. And we're seeing them show up more in um, these uh, after fire samples too. So what this is basically, um, echidnas have been commonly known as ant and termite eaters. This is not actually true. Um, we know from previous um, studies and from anecdotal evidence that echidnas eat a range of ants, termites, but also beetles, insect larvae and fungi. And what we're finding from the gut microbiome research is that they're also plants and soil are a very big part of echidna diet too. And we're seeing that shift um, to more plant-based uh, in the post-fires as well versus uh, more soil or more termite-based too. So that's really interesting for us. This project has kind of opened up more questions than it has ever solved, which is the, um, the beauty of science really. So we're now interested in trying to find out exactly what these change, diet changes are, which we can still use our genetic tools to do that. The issue right now is that we need the reference databases to actually link back the DNA to the species, which is a huge challenge in genetic work at the moment. We're going to we're trying to look at doing some more um, insect and plant based work to characterize the environment first so that we can then link it back to the echidna scats. We're also trying to find out now how quickly microbiomes are likely to change uh, and if they will actually ever recover. Uh, and if this is very similar in different fire regions or in different animals, this is, like I said, I don't think this has been done in any um, wild animal that I know of. So yeah, that is, that is my presentation. Thank you so much to all of our collaborators and especially the citizen scientists in part of this project. And um, here's just some information about me. If you want to get to know um, me more or you want to uh, have a chat, please do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Talia. So much. What, what Talia didn't mention is that Echidna CSI was a finalist in this year's Citizen Science Eureka Prize. So uh, congratulations for that. Thank and now you. I'd like to welcome all of our speakers back to the main stage. There we go. And we'll kick off our panel discussion. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to thank you all so much for your, your talks. They're all so, so fascinating and, and wonderful in their own right. I'm going to kick us off um, with a question, um, and then we'll go to the, the ones in the discussion forum. I'm really interesting, interested to know what is most needed um, from a conservation management perspective in terms of how we list species under the Threatened uh, Species EPBC Act and what role citizen science has on this. So how can citizen scientists help in this effort? Well, I'll just throw it out there. That's a good question, Erin. Um, I guess I can speak to this. Um, 
having sat on a couple of those scientific committees that and currently sitting on the Commonwealth one that lists species under EPBC Act. And it's interesting to see so many talks that are focused on, you know, threatened taxa. And, and I'm thinking through watching these, you know, the kinds of information that we need in, in those committees to list things. Um, and I think that there's great potential for citizen science to do an even stronger job at providing the kind of information that we really need. So, for instance, I asked Lauren during her talk, um, you know, do you collect data on where the flossies are feeding, you know, and what and where the key food resource trees are for the species? Because that would be considered what we call habitat critical to the survival of a species potentially when listing under EPPC Act. So that's the kind of information that we really do need. So yeah, can we you definitely, on? yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um, we definitely do. So um, we have a sightings form that you can put the location in, you can write a little bit of free text about what the what the glossies are doing, how many they are in like at that area, if there's males, females, juveniles. Mm -hmm. And um, you can actually send a photo as well. And so from just the project's sighting app, we've um, been able to identify over 2,000 feed trees in the wow. corridor, which has been really amazing. And we've been able to store all that data into Bionet and protect those trees. And, um, you know, we've seen that in um, come up through council where there's been roadsides or even the train line um, is full of Alicajarita and they've had to change how they're going to manage that roadside. Due to the data that's been collected. Yeah. So it's really <laughs> that's awesome. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it shows, yeah, yeah, it's one of those really good things where it comes back to the community as well, because the community get more engaged with the species and they start to see these um, threats to their habitat. And then they also see all of the organizations working together from the data that they've collected. So yeah. it's perfect. I know it's all about closing that loop, I think, you know, mm -hmm. to for people who are nominating species as well, you know, to understand. And I think in direct response to Erin's question, I think when designing citizen science programs, a really useful thing to do is to download the um, nomination forms for either your state threatened species committee or the EPBC Act and look at the kind of information that's required to make a strong nomination for a species to be listed as threatened. That's really a good place to start to try and understand the sort of data that we need. Often we don't, we can't do much with just occurrences. We have quite a lot of occurrence data already. Often what we're interested in is more nuanced things about the number of mature individuals or, you know, the provision of, of habitat that's critical for the species. So that would be my main suggestion for anyone who's curious about how to do this a little better. Thank you, Rachel. And John, we lost you for a bit, but we see you're back. We're just talking about listing th the threatened species on the EPBC app. One more question before I throw to some of the discussion. Um, I was wondering if when, if, when, definitely if, another disaster event happens, what in your opinion is the best way to engage the community in being part of the monitoring and recovery effort? And what additional projects or resources do we need to produce? That's to anyone. It's a huge question. <laughs> it is. You can chunk it down. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Uh, I saw in, in the chat there was a question about before and after data. So, you know, that's really, I think, where citizen science comes in is the opportunity like Thomas's project and Rachel's and Lauren's and Talia's <laughs> to, uh, to actually have before data so that uh, if you've got landscape scale data and then, um, uh, you know, an extreme event occurs, you can collect some, some um, after data. The, the challenge, of course, is timing. So, you know, having resources ready to go that can be quickly distributed is, is probably the, one of the things uh, that would be quite valuable. As we saw with Thomas's project, um, the community is fantastic but there's I'd, i would also say that it's in a way um the tip of the iceberg there's so much more data that can be collected and uh you know if you were able to to whether it's through engagement or whether it's through actually 
um, some formalized surveys as well, uh, then you'd be able to collect greater data. Anyway, th there's so many ways to approach that, Erin. I guess it's it's having a, a bigger community of already active participants who you've therefore you've got before data and therefore they could get right into after data. The other part is actually the comms. You really want to be able to say to people, um, look, there's there are fires happening. Let's get some data before they hit this site and let's get out there when it's safe and get some more data. One of the things that we have, uh, we know there's a number of biases, but you could imagine that people are out there and what are they they're doing? They're taking the photos and submitting them the things that they're interested in. Um, and hence uh, that comment that Thomas made about having some broader data beyond the the uh, birds and the mammals and the, and the plants and actually having the invertebrate data. So anyway, it's infinite. If I could just quickly jump in as well, uh, I think this doesn't apply as much to say Talia's and Lauren's projects since they're species specific, but I think for ones that involve a lot of species, getting out into the community and teaching them uh, what photos need to be taken of which groups of organisms to help identify them. And a lot with our project was you'd get really keen people that are making observations in remote areas that wouldn't have been reached by us otherwise, you know, just after the fires, but they'd be taking photos of eucalypts from like 100 meters away uh, or, or, or similar situations like that. And then, you know, we can say that it's a eucalypt, but, but it comes a lot more difficult to narrow on and that species specific data is often a lot more useful uh, and helpful for doing things like conservation assessments. So I think just, yeah, getting out into, into the community and presenting workshops and saying, you know, if you're taking photos of plants, you need to take X, Y, and Z features. Whereas if you're taking photos of insects, you need to try and, and just really try and uh, improve the quality of that data in a sense to make it easier for us as well. Yeah, I think I would just chime in there and say that's right, Thomas. Like, you know, it's really, that's part of what Flora Connections is sort of trying to do is to produce guides to make sure that people are taking the kinds of features that we actually need. And I guess it comes back to Lauren's project as well, you know, which is a really cool illustration of what you can do with a really well taken photograph. I've seen it done with dolphins, but I've never seen it done with birds. <laughs> so it's really cool. And and Lauren, can I can I Erin, if you don't mind, can I ask Lauren, do you um do you can can I take photos of the glossies across the street and upload those? I'm on the central coast. Is it just a local project? Or? Um, it is a local project, but we have other keen beans who've been doing it in other areas as well. And that's the other thing with this project is we've developed like a protocol which we can mm -hmm. give out to other um, bird groups or areas that want to start their own flossy project um, mm -hmm. because it would really be interesting to see that kind of movement data. We were hoping that we'd find that in our project, but it seems like they just stay in the same little group and then this group stays over here and then they maybe move around seasonally, but uh, we haven't seen those massive movement sort of um, photos in different areas kind of thing. Mm. But there's definitely a project up in the Gold Coast as well, Gold Coast area and um, Southeast Queensland that are taking photos too. So your birds might be linked in with them. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Sounds like you're going to start a new Flossies project, right? I know. I can give you the protocol. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. You should start that up. I love my Flossies. Who doesn't? Yeah. All right. I'll move on now to some of the, the questions in the discussion forum. The first one up is from Oliver to John. And John, Oliver is wondering if the goal of your project is to assess recovery. Can you also capture the ecological function of the area or does the citizen science aspect limit it to the population? Yeah, there are huge limitations. Um, given that we know very little, the, the starting point would actually be to say which species are, are utilizing any resources that are provided. And so water is actually a, a great starting point there because we all pretty much drink. Um, a lot of anim some animals get water from their food, but a lot of other animals get it from drinking. Uh, yeah, and so you know we're grappling with that question in some of our internal discussions about the ecosystem implications of provisioning and how do we assess that. And to be honest, I don't have an answer at this point. It's um, it's it's a really big question to 
to be able to tackle with some point source arrays of cameras <laughs> associated with um, provisioning resources and also some control sites to be able to say, well, this is what's happening in the landscape and this has actually helped. Um, yeah, so watch this space and happy to discuss further with other people who maybe had a bolt of lightning during this session. All right, we'll stay with you just for a sec. And Fiona's wondering if it's just if the app is just for use uh, after wildfires or can it be used by uh, urban communities to monitor wildlife? Mm. So it can be used anywhere. It isn't uh, restricted. The, the aim is in response to extreme events. And so we initially started this in response to bushfires, but I could be, we've already discussed the, the scenario with heat waves and drought and floods. So there's, you know, I fully anticipate that people will be implementing provisioning actions in response to those different um, catastrophic events, cyclones, et cetera. So uh, in the urban context, I can certainly see that uh, collecting some information about if you were feeding wildlife or if you were providing nest boxes, there's certainly some value there and there's certainly interest there. Um, but it isn't that they're not necessarily who we're trying to engage with in the first instance. Um, so yeah, it, it's one of those challenging ones. Most citizen science projects either diversify from having really targeted groups like Lauren's or broadcasting for everyone like Thomas. And this one sort of can account for both, but from a fire perspective would really benefit from the targeted groups and having those networks that are already integrated, uh, working together and, and working with you, um, the, the research group. So the answer is yes, but that it's complicated. <laughs> okay. Okay. And here's a question for Lauren, but I guess it can be posed of, of all of the projects. Um, Fiona is wondering how you engage your community initially. We'll start with you, Lauren. Yep. Um, so when the project was brand new, there was, um, there was actually um, grassroots community groups that were interested in glossies in that area that were already planting trees and and um, the, there's a very avid bird group there as well. And so we sort of got into those networks quite early, but also did like a road show. So you just go to all of the halls throughout the Western Great Western Wildlife Corridor and we got a heap of amazing bird experts from all over Australia, some down from well, some glossy experts, some from Kangaroo Island. We got Matt Cameron from the West and just got it really everyone excited about glossies and it was it was fantastic actually because one of the glossy gang Kay who lives up in the north of the corridor she didn't know what a glossy black cockatoo was when when she came to the the info session and she was talking about how the feed trees always have those horrible ball bearings on the ground and make her fall over and all this sort of stuff and and then she was like I have these birds come to my dam every night and I, you know, and then she started taking photos of them and that's sort of where we sort of developed the, the Flossies project from. And then once we sort of, um, there was quite a, there was a couple of other projects that had done photo identification with, with Glossies, but we didn't know if it would work in our area and we didn't know if we could use citizen science to do it. So we just really started to, to experiment and, um, and all of the work that was in my, in my slides, all of those, uh, lookbooks, all of the photos that were all put in there, they're all built by the Glossy Gang. That's not me. That's them doing that amazing data. Mm. And um, and it's a lot of time and it's a lot of energy and it's a lot of dedication. And it's so um, enriching to our project because, you know, to get that kind of species population data for, for a bird in that area is quite hard. And it's only one of me. So it's been amazing to be able to sort of engage like that. And in terms of keeping, like, that was the first stage of it was just doing the doing the roadshow, telling people about what we're doing, um, and then also asking for sightings and training people to recognise glossies. Um, and then once we did that, we started having a Facebook presence with the local council. So we have really good partners in that area as well that already run um, environmental projects, so like Land for Wildlife and are really active yeah. with landholders in that area. Um, and we started sort of doing lots of news articles and videos as well, but also um, getting people from those information sessions to sign up to our project to get a newsletter and so we just do quarterly newsletters and tell them cool flossy facts and glossy facts and keep people mm. engaged that way hmm. wonderful yeah. how about you thomas how have you managed to keep your community engaged yeah so 
with projects on iNaturalist, you've got a, a journal feature where we kind of semi-regularly would post updates to all the users and, and people were kind of very keen to hear what papers we'd published. Uh, you know, we, we provided highlights of questions that had popped up. Um, I think one thing that we're very lucky with iNaturalist in terms of engagement and getting participation is that obviously it, it was a pre-existing platform used for many other projects as well. So not only were we able to get uh, a whole lot of new users through advertising, through social media and, and traditional media, but we we're also able to leverage all the super users that already existed on iNaturalist. Uh, so you've got all these people from across the whole country that are pumping out, you know, thousands of observations of things every single month. We went specifically to those users, those high volume users and said, okay, we want you to continue pumping out that, that really high output and amazing data, but can you go to these burnt areas, you know, instead of your, your usual haunts. And so that, uh, really hugely boosted, I think, participation, um, and also provided inspiration for the new users as well, which I think was so people will be coming on, joining iNaturalist for the first time, joining the project. And instead of it kind of being a blank slate, they see all these amazing uh, organisms and photos that people have already uploaded. And in a lot of cases, that kind of inspires them to go out and try and themselves. So, so yeah, I think it was ultimately a nice combination of uh, an absolute deluge of, of advertising on social media and, and traditional media and getting the new users, but then combining it with that dedicated pool of existing super users as well to really help boost things. Terrific. The next question is for you, Talia. Uh, Oliver is wondering if there's any other projects such as the School of Ants that can help inform your research and to try and understand why you're seeing that change in diet? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, my whole goal at the moment is to collaborate with as many other groups as possible. So. Uh, for example, on Kangaroo Island, we have a pretty good relationship with um, entomologists on there and other uh, uh, genetic entomologists uh, at Adelaide Uni as well, um, and trying to form those connections so that, yeah, we aren't just doing, trying to do everything ourselves and trying to get the most out of other people's expertise. I guess the limiting thing at the moment is honestly just funding. So we've got the, the people, we've got the, the data, we've got material. Um, but sequencing costs still cost money and people's time still cost money. So that's where we're at a limitation at the moment. Um, we're looking into uh, trying to source some crowdfunding at the moment as a bit of a, like, let's stop relying on, we'll hopefully stop relying on grant funding and try and get it from a different source. So I don't know if anyone else has any ideas or have any uh, experience with either doing a crowdfunding or going through industry routes or going through different portals of, of finding money because I think that's a theme across this conference is government funding is hard, especially in citizen science. Any thoughts from the panel on that? I work on plants, so no one ever wants to have money. <laughs> I was going to say just but get all the on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've got you've got an echidna, so you're yeah. halfway there, I reckon. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Q factor, the Q factor should save us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe if it's sequencing costs and things, maybe there are some some grant routes like through bio platforms and places like that. You know, there's a lot of national infrastructure that's been invested in for doing sequencing work mm. where, you know, you don't get money for a warm body to do the pipetting, but you do get the sequencing costs, you know. So I would encourage you to talk to Bio Platforms Australia about yeah. what they're doing in the threatened species space. Mm -hmm. But yes, funding is a is an ongoing challenge, and you're right, and a recurring theme over the past few days. Rachel, the next question is for you from Fiona. Um, wondering uh, to expand your data collection, is there funding available to engage professional botanists instead of relying solely on the volunteers? Yes, there is, Fiona. Yes, so Dor have invested quite heavily after the fires in um, in EPBC Act uh, assessments for the plant species. So there's about, there's somewhere in the order of 200 plant species that will come via the Threatened Species Scientific Committee over the next couple of years. And those um, 
data is being collected for those in the field by various projects that were funded under the Bushfire Recovery Fund. And then there's also a suite of professional botanists who are being uh, engaged, you know, on a case by case basis um, to review, uh, to review uh, nominations, oh, sorry, to review assessment documents that come through. So it is um, quite coordinated. I guess it's just you know, we know that there's lots of people going out to walk around and, and look out in the field and we'd like to engage them as well. Wonderful. Well, we are just, just about to time. I might just give anyone just some time for any further reflections or, or comments or plugs that they might want to do. Start, maybe I'll go from the top of the screen down. So we'll start with you, Talia, and then Rachel. Sure. <laughs> you can find the Kids and Seat site everywhere. <laughs> um, we've got all the social medias and if you if you log uh, through our app and then we can get your email address and we make communication through that. Um, I guess final thoughts are even though the bushfires were devastating, I think it did enable a new type of research or a, a additional funding opportunities, things like that, so that we could actually do some really cool things, make some new apps, do some new projects. Um, and that's I guess the positive side of all of this research. I was meant to be writing up my thesis while I did the side project and then <laughs> became another chapter of my thesis. So um, yeah, that, that's all for me. Thank you. Rachel? Uh, yeah, so my plugs would be for, for uh, plants in general. And although everyone else who's in the symposium is pretty much an animal person, from a plant's perspective, I wouldn't use the words catastrophic or devastating or any of the emotive terms to talk about a bushfire. You know, plants have evolved in Australia to cope with bushfire. You know, it's been an evolutionary shaping force in the flora. So it's really about thinking about those interacting threats that come in over the top and fire frequency. They're the two most important things for plants in the recovery sense. Most plants love a fire. They love to, it helps them germinate, it kills off the senescent adults. Um, so yeah, thinking about plants and, you know, thinking more broadly about them is my plug. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. John and then Lauren. Uh, so we've all talked about people being a part of these projects. And I think the social sciences are something that a lot of us would benefit from engaging with. Uh, I think a lot of us have more, um, quantitative ecological experience and understanding the motivations and the values of participants and uh, the experiences that, that we all share, uh, I think has real value. And I'm certainly moving into that space as part of ideally all projects. And I think that's probably the, the frontier for citizen science is, it already is happening, but it's not something that's being talked a lot about in this, um, Whole conference. Yeah, I agree with you, John. Um, I suppose in terms of plugs, yeah, if you'd like to set up a Glossies project or if you'd like to learn more about Glossies, head to the Glossies in the Miss um, project page and you can get on to me. Shout out to Annie from the South Coast Flossies as well. And um, in terms of thoughts, it's been a really um, amazing thing being able to connect really traumatized and um, and and reeling communities who've been living right on those fire margins or in the fire and, and connect them back to nature through our work, which I think we don't talk about quite a lot as well. Is, is, it's very good to get all this information about post-fire um, recovery and all of that sort of stuff, but it's also a really good way and a really big shift in our um, cultural psyche, as John was saying, that you can link people back into their environment and see that it is recovering and that it is going to you know, come back differently, but it's still... Um, focusing back on what is there, which has been a really amazing part that's come out of my project. Um, so yeah. Wonderful. Thomas? Uh, I guess two, just two quick plugs. One is that if you're out there in the field uh, engaging in any of these citizen science projects, uh, there's a great opportunity, I think, for cross-pollination and to be doing all of them simultaneously. So have your camera out, snapping photos of the glossies up in the trees, and then also trying to get some poop from the echidna that's going past taking photos of the plants, but then also looking on the plants for the insects as well. So I think really trying to mm -hmm. capture the whole spectrum of biodiversity is very helpful. Uh, and also that next year at the end of February and the start of March, we'll actually be running three bio blitzes uh, in conjunction with the CSIRO. 
um, in burnt areas. So one in the Blue Mountains, one up at Coffs, and one down in the south coast at Marmarang National Park. And whole weekend of going out and uh, bio blitzing in burnt areas and unburnt areas. Uh, and so I yeah, strongly urge everyone that can to head out to at least one of those events and hopefully we can we can get a huge amount of data. Love it. Great, great plug. I was going to do it if you weren't going to. Thomas. <laughs> um, so thank you so much on behalf of all the people in this forum and um, the panelists. We just wanted to say thank you for uh, coming today and chatting and to all the listeners. Thank you so much for your considered questions and discussion. I think we've heard a lot about the importance of baseline monitoring. I love the idea of cross pollination and doing multiple things when we're out there. There's so many different and amazing initiatives and um, I think it's really, really inspiring. So thank you once again, and we'll see everyone first thing tomorrow morning at 9.30. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Bye.